Hey, welcome to the session Object Cache for Faster Dynamic Data. So in this session, we're going to talk a lot about the WordPress Object Cache, how you can use it, leverage it, make sure that your sites that have a lot of dynamic data, a lot of custom post types, custom fields, taxonomies, you know, team pages, membership sites, recipe sites, e-commerce, you know, all of these sites that end up using a lot of data. We're going to see how we can make sure that they're as fast and performant as possible. Something that's great for you, great for your users, great for your bottom line. So let's jump into it with a little background about myself. My name is Brian. I'm the technology director at HTC. We're a WordPress agency and a WordPress VIP partner. I've been working in WordPress for the last 10 years as a developer. I've gotten to work with a lot of big clients in the education and nonprofit space. So places like Harvard, UCLA, Hyatt. I've worked in the industry of WordPress as well with places like wordpress.com. Um, I've spoken at WordCamps. I do content on YouTube and I also write for a lot of the industry publications like WP Tavern and WP Minute. So there's a link to my website where you can kind of see where all that stuff is. But suffice to say, my background is really focused on WordPress, WordPress development, and especially on WordPress sites that go beyond the basic blog or marketing site, sites that have a lot of dynamic data, a lot of, a lot of custom post types, a lot of fields and metadata and that sort of stuff, and, and working on how to make those performant when you get to a really large scale. So let's just start with a big question. What is dynamic data, at least in the context of this conversation? You're going to hear from a lot of great speakers today about dynamic data, and everyone's going to have sort of a different approach to it. And it might mean different things, different places, but I think overall there's some general stuff that we can all agree on what dynamic data is. And for this particular presentation, what we're talking about is, number one, anything that has to be queried or looked up. So Dynamic data is not really just like the basic content in a page on WordPress. It's when you start getting a little bit more advanced. You use custom post types, you use custom fields, you use taxonomies. You're starting to connect different things together. You want to be able to make relationships between different objects. And if I look at this, you know, blog post and then I pull in some related posts beneath it that I think have the same category, that's going to be dynamic. It's going to be different on every page. All of that stuff, you know, has to be looked up from the database. There's a lot of cost to it to do the logic, to do that thinking, to pull it all into memory, all of that sort of stuff. So that's where dynamic data comes in. And another way to talk about that is content that might look different at different times or to different users. So maybe one person loads a page and they see uh, a certain, you know, set of recommended a blog post to continue that example, somebody else might see something else on different articles. You might see different things. Logged in users might see different content than logged out users. So anything that's really not static, anything that's just really dynamic changes for the context that it's in. That's another example of dynamic data. And I think a third way to say it is really any content that gets onto the WordPress page in some way that just feels complicated or complex, anything other than I went into the, you know, WordPress editor and I put some content in anything beyond that, that's probably dynamic data. There's probably some database queries that have to run to kind of pick the right stuff and put it in there. So that's what we're really focused on today is that process. And, you know, a tool that we're going to talk about that's built into WordPress, that if you just kind of pay attention to different settings, do a couple of experiments, you can make sure that it's actually keeping that dynam dynamic data uh, super fast, super performant. So to Take this out of the realm of explanation and into a real practical example. We're going to look at just a recipe blog. I think it's a great example of dynamic data and something that might seem a little simple at first, just, you know, a blog and actually be a lot more complicated. So right here, this is Bon Appetit. I'm going to click on it. We're going to look at their real website right now. So what we see here is basically a blog that has a number of different posts in it. And we can see that the posts have things like categories, recipes. They have things like ratings that might be a custom field or custom custom metadata. They'll also have things like these filters, right? So these might be also categories on the blog post. They might be some other sort of tag. There's some additional taxonomies here like filtering by diets, filtering by cuisines. So this is just different ways where you can take the content on the page and make it more dynamic because it's filterable, it's searchable, and all that sort of stuff. But these lists of, you know, pulling in all the list of the cuisines, pulling in the list of all the diets, pulling in all that stuff. Each one of these is more and more additional queries that have to be run on the page. An example, if I come up here, they even have the same sorts of different queries up here where there's additional filters, additional queries. And so a lot of times you'll see things that are pulled in multiple places on the same page, or it has to be pulled multiple times just to render a single page. So 
dynamic data is really about this isn't something somebody just wrote the static code for. This is every little piece of the menu of these filters of the blog posts themselves is, you know, really adding up to hundreds of different database calls throughout the, the, the rendering of this page. So what or why is an object cache? Well, let's start with the problem. Complex database queries are slow, they're expensive, and they may have to be made multiple times on the single page load. You might be running the same thing over and over. You might be wanting to get the same data over and over. You might have a really complicated, you know, query where you're getting your recipes, but you're filtering by multiple filters and taxonomies and ratings and different things like that. So these become expensive, they become slow. And the goal is to make the process of fetching all this data faster so that WordPress can build the page faster, especially in sites like this where that dynamic interaction is expected and you can't just, you know, have everything statically cached. So the method that we use for this, this object cache, is we run the query and we take that big, you know, result of whatever, you know, whatever we got back, we save it in memory the first time, and then any other times that we go back for that same piece of information, we don't even have to talk to the database because it's sitting right there in memory. We've already run it once and it's waiting for you. And the solution for that, and this is part of WordPress core, it's called the WP object cache. So before we dig into the object cache and look at like a brief example of it, let's clarify what is not in an object cache. Number one, this is not about caching things like your CSS or your JavaScript. There are, you know, good reasons and tools for caching that sort of stuff. That's just not what an object cache is or related to. This is not about storing images in some sort of like CDN or keeping things, you know, on different data servers, that sort of stuff. That's also just unrelated to an object cache, but still good, you know, but good practices for performance. This is also not a page cache that saves the page that you're looking at as like static HTML. So there's a lot of good plugins in WordPress where they'll take your page and they'll just create a nice flat HTML version of it so that when people come to visit it, it loads super fast. That's great. There's a lot of good times where you can use that, but often with dynamic sites where you need a lot of filtering and interaction, that's not always going to be the case because the minute somebody, you know, changes some sort of filter or loads some obscure page, or maybe they're logged in or something like that, the whole thing of getting dynamic pages is that you probably couldn't generate the HTML for every single page. So page caches, caching assets, those are all great things and, you know, come into play, but this, that's not specifically what an object cache is. The object cache is about getting stuff directly from the database or like external APIs and just keeping it ready in memory so you don't have to keep running to the database for the same sorts of stuff. So this is just a screenshot of the WordPress developer resources and they have some good stuff sort of explaining the WordPress object cache and what it does and how it relates and we'll kind of break down a few of these things. But what's most important is this area down at the bottom where we see these different functions that's really how a developer interacts with the WP object cache. You really use functions like setting the cache and getting the cache. And so we're going to look at a real practical example of that. But there's some other additional functions here. And if you want to get deeper into understanding how it all works, you can definitely go and read the developer resources and kind of dig into a lot of the thinking that went behind this. So we're going to look at a really basic example in the wild. So let's go over here to our our recipe blog and we have this drop down where we pull in the cuisines and the issue here is that we're going to pull this list of cuisines in multiple places because it's going to show up maybe as links in the footer and the header and you know maybe it's going to show up on different pages that i want to be able to filter and search so i need to basically save myself from getting that from the database every single time so here's an example of a function where we're going to get the cuisines and there's two different things we're basically doing one is that we're always going to check and see if it's in our object cache. So we're going to use WP cache get and just a little string that kind of sh like what we kind of named it, just a little special name that we came up with it. You might put a prefix in front of it or something like that. And then if it doesn't exist, then we'll go and actually run that whole query. And when the most important part, when we're done running, you know, that WP query or whatever, we're going to set the results back in the cache so that the next time we go and get the cuisines, the next time this gets called, this will actually return something. It'll skip this whole place where we were doing our expensive query and it'll just return the cuisines. So it's really important that, you know, the object cache always kind of assumes that you're not going to be able to find the information and has the ability to go get the information for you. But you always, you know, 
want to err on the side of, I hope I can get this information quickly and not have to run some expensive query, you know, a WP query or get terms or something like that, you know, each time that you want to get that list of cuisines. So this is where you'll see a lot of examples of WP object cache and kind of the way that you can just sort of store that information sitting just in the memory of your PHP application as, you know, as WordPress is running and building the page. Okay. So question, doesn't WordPress do this for me already? And the answer is yes. Sometimes, sort of, unless if you're using custom database tables, if you're using functions like get posts or you're writing any custom WordPress DB direct calls to the database, then you're going outside of the cache. In those cases, you really are responsible for doing this. Another example is if you're doing like searches and lookups, if you have very common searches that you know get searched on every page or you're manually writing queries where you're using a search or multi-dimensional queries where you're searching by, you know, post meta and a taxonomy and, you know, it's this really complicated query that you use that anything that's not really like the main query of WordPress, whatever that current page is or archive is, those aren't really going to be cached. So you got to usually add those yourself. And then another example, which we'll talk about a little bit later, is if you're actually getting data from somewhere else, like you're, you have an API endpoint that you always hit to get specific things. You have an e-commerce store and you know, when you want to get the tax rates for a specific zip code, you actually hit some other endpoint. So that data isn't being cached, but it's an opportunity to, that is something that you can do. So we'll get into that. But the next question is, how do I find these slow queries? So what I recommend doing, I do this on pretty much every site that I'm always working on. I download Query Monitor, a free plugin for WordPress, and I install it. And there's some other ones, I think Debugger, Debug Bar, there's different ones. I just like Query Monitor. I think it's the best and the simplest and the most powerful. And so what Query Monitor does is, among many, many other things, one of the things it does is it shows you all your queries, all the different database queries. So you can see in this screenshot that comes from their website, there's a bunch of different types of database queries happening, and they're showing you how many, and they're showing you how long they're all taking, and they're showing you which plugin or which plugin or theme or where in core that it's actually happening. But they have other different things you can look at, like, are there queries that are duplicate that are happening multiple times? A great time to look into WP object cache. Sometimes if you have some slow queries, there will be a big red bar here that says slow queries. Those are queries to look at. Maybe there's something you can do there to optimize them and, you know, maybe cache results, things like that. So this is a great place to look and see like, you know, what is taking so long on my website? Where can I move a little bit faster? So it's really great that the object cache saves some of these trips and stuff like that, but that's just in the context of a single page load. So every time the page loads again, you know, all the data is fetched again. And obviously that's, there's definitely use cases where you really want that to happen. So the question is how long does an object cache last? It lasts a single page load unless you, there's two options here. Number one is a persistent object cache plugin, which means it persists over multiple page loads, which, um, is really powerful and we'll talk about it. And then there's something called the transients API, which we'll look at very briefly. A persistent object cache means that the dynamic data stays in memory over multiple page loads. So if things aren't changing on the back end of your website, if the list of you know cuisines in the recipe is not changing, there's really no reason you can't cache it on a page load and then just use that again for the next person who visits the page and so on. So um, a persistent object cache is something that you implement with a plugin, but it's also really connected to what kind of server you're hosting on. And in that case, it's really important to work with your host. So number one, query monitor, if you open it, it'll tell you if you have a persistent object cache or if you don't on the front, on like the main page of query monitor, it'll say persistent cache plugin not in use. If that's the case, check with your hosting company. They'll have one that they recommend because there's different types of persistent object caches based on the type of server environment they use. But every Pretty much every good WordPress host will tell you which one or have like their recommended solution for it. And the third piece about this is things are going to stay in the cache a lot longer. That's going to save you a lot. The downside is things are going to stay in the cache a lot longer and you're going to have to be a little bit smarter about when do I clear the cache? You know, if you've ever had that issue with a client where they update something, but the front end is not really updating, they got to clear their page cache. You kind of get a similar thing where you need to sort of be more intelligent about clearing out the cache if you know some data changes. What's really great about this is there's functions like those WP cache get and set functions that we talked about. There's functions that you can also use to tell it, hey, you know, every time somebody saves this type of post type, flush the cache, something like that. So it's very um, doable. Otherwise, 
most hosting companies will recommend a persistent cache and any recommendation will usually have a like flush cache button if you just manually need to. The other thing was that WP Transients API. Basically, this is a very similar thing to the WordPress object cache, but really the difference here is with the WP Transients API, if you have a persistent object cache, then it's they actually use the same stuff under the hood, so they kind of work exactly the same. But if you don't, it's another way to let things stay over multiple page loads. So say you don't have a persistent object cache, what WP Transients API will do is you can use very similar functions to the example that we looked at, but they'll let you actually, it'll actually store it in the database. And I know that sounds, well, what's the point? We were saving trips to the database, but think of it like I have some really expensive queries that have to look across multiple tables and they have to filter by terms, by postmen and all this stuff. And it takes a long time. The Transients API, you can take all that and stick it in one row in the database and you'll, it's a lot faster to get it back. And you can also set an expiration date. You can say like, hey, bring me this back. But if it's been in there for like more than a day, just get it fresh, delete it. And it'll respect that. So it's a great way to sort of have a little bit more control and say like, I don't mind if stuff sits in here for a day or two, but I don't want it longer. That's the Transients API for you. And I think the example use case you'll see this a lot for is external REST API references. So if you're trying to get some data from some other API or something, that you use on your site and you don't want to hit it on every single page load you just want to hit it like once every 12 hours or something you store it in the transients api it's going to sit there and you can set an expiration for it so when you research the wp object cache you're going to see a lot about transients api they're both great tools for data persisting across multiple page loads so let's talk about some next steps and there will be a q a in the chat so First, I would say if you're working on sites with a lot of dynamic data, just download Query Monitor, put it on your site and just look, you know, do you have queries that you need to worry about? Are there duplicate queries? Are there expensive, slow queries slowing it down? Are there, it'll even tell you if there's like API calls that you're making, you know, that are slowing you down. Sometimes plugins are always like doing things and, and they're slowing you down. So Query Monitor, just dig into it and explore. Check in there if you have a persistent object cache and if that's kind of good for your situation. A lot of times that solves a lot of issues for clients where they're just, you know, things just feels like their site just takes forever to load, to turn on. It just like enter WordPress, you know, WP admin. It's just like, why is this taking so long? So check with that, check with your hosting company. And then if you get to it and you actually have some custom code or something like that, then, you know, optimize the code. You use those functions like WP cache, get and set and optimize you know, your site so that things load as fast as possible. If you have any other questions about this, definitely ask in the Q&A. I put a link in this slide right here. There's a free video series where I go over Query Monitor as well as some of the other tools that you would use for performance in that modern kind of WordPress environment. And thank you again for sticking around for Object Cache for faster dynamic data.